Welcome in to the Flow Track Podcast. I'm Kevin Sully, joined by Gordon Mack. Special hello to those watching live on YouTube this morning. Gordon, how are you? Doing good. It was a good weekend for uh, for me. Sixers won. I was excited about that. Uh, now I got to wait till Wednesday for my next NBA game. For those who are just joining the podcast now, I'm a huge uh, Sixers NBA fan. So this is going to be a wild two months for me. Kind of, I'm going to be going through the NCAs and Olympic trials and also going through the trials and tribulations of being a Philadelphia sports fan. So I'm um, looking forward to and not looking forward to this summer. But first, I was gonna, first game started off okay. So that's okay. I, I was going to say we should just get used to the fact that every podcast from this point forward is just going to be in with me saying, how are you? And your answer is only going to be determined by whether or not the Sixers won the Correct. day before, basically. Yeah. Correct. So, but hey, they won by seven points, the same amount of points that the 2015 Warriors won by. Jeez. So they're on pace to become the next dynasty. So let's, Please just, stop. let's do this. Please just, 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 let's just you know, calm that was down. Funny. That was funny when I, I sent that to you. I you did. So you've been tracking all the similarities. You're you're delving into weird trends throughout time. You're going to ask me, what's Joel Embiid spelled backwards? Oh, it's Clay Thompson's middle name. They're the same thing as the Warriors. Oh, my gosh. Steve Kerr, Doc Rivers, same person. It's going to be – I mean, I hope it's two months for your sake. It could be, the, it could be a wild <laughs> month for you. It could be a wild couple of weeks. I think you'll get by Washington, though. So congrats on your game one victory against – one of the best below 500 playoff teams uh, that the NBA has to offer this year. Well done. Speaking of the playoffs, I'm not sure if you watch many of them games. Did you watch any of the games? Yeah, I watched most of them. Most of the the teams now have like 10,000 plus fans. Yeah, yeah. And it felt it was weird. It was like it was it's so loud. Like it was like it's just such like why is everyone cheering all the time and. <laughs> Going like a year and a half without fans, you forget like what it's like to have them. And it just made me think about what sports can be like now that we're trying to get back to normal. And it also just kind of – you kind of wish that, you know, hopefully – I mean, I know the trials are struggling with um, figuring out what they're going to do with their fan situation. Because I know yeah. Oregon is in, in a, is in a unique situation with what their rules are, but – Man, I hope that they're able to have fans at the track because it is just so different when there's fans. This is like wild. So. so do you remember because the NBA playoffs were one of the first like big events post COVID. Like they did the bubble, right? I mean yeah. there were other sports that, that that did it too. And I know baseball started playing with fans, but NBA it had this sound stage feel and we all wondered, well, how awkward is it gonna be? And they had curtains up and they had the virtual fans so it made it feel <clears throat> less empty than it actually was but you're i'm with you it was like a year of that and i got used to that and i remember watching i was watching last night the jazz and the grizzlies game and i don't know how many fans the jazz had but it seemed like a lot right and when you're watching on tv yeah. if the lower part is filled or close to filled it might as well be filled because you can't see the upper deck yeah and Bogdanovich from the Jazz made a shot, got back on defense, and did the get loud motion to the crowd. And I realized it had been a year basically since I had seen anybody do that. That That's such a <laughs> common thing in sports to call on the crowd to make some noise basically, right? Let's get this big defensive stop. And it, it was such a common thing for players to do, and we just hadn't seen it at all. And I got – I got excited about it. I'm not a jazz fan, but yeah. I just got excited that there were people there to respond. I know the Knicks game obviously was was big because it was in Madison Square Garden and they had was it a third full? It sounded completely full when you're watching it on TV. That's the thing. When you go from piped in generic noise to ten thousand people, it sounds, it amazing. sounds like yeah. you're in the middle of a rock concert. Yeah. 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 And you know, speaking of Oregon and as it pertains to the trials, I, I mean, I don't think the Blazers are gonna have no fans. When they when they play in a couple of days when they host Denver, I think Blazers are going to have some fans in the stands. So I I hope yes for the athletes' sake that they're able to figure it out for for the Olympic trials because it does make such a huge difference. Team sports, individual sports, doesn't matter. The golf yesterday, 
Yeah. Like people Mickelson. are going nuts about the golf. Yeah. Well, yeah. just the amount of people, the amount of people that were there. Like you're right. It looks weird. It looks awkward. And it's strange to think that that's how it always was. And I hope that's how it can be for at least a couple of meets this summer. People, uh, one last thing on the NBA. This is kind of inside the NBA ish. <laughs> uh, there was a lot of like good three pointing teams that uh, didn't shoot well in like the first half. And right. I think it's because they got so used to not having fans cheer and boo with different every shot that it kind of threw them off a bit. Because they probably got, mm. yes, obviously they've been playing in front of fans basically their entire career. But when you go like a year and a half without it, you kind of get used to that silence. And I think like the loudness kind of was like, oh, whoa, and might throw you off a bit. But I think the well, that's what I was wondering. Back to norm. Yeah. Well, well, as it pertains to running and the trials, that's what I was wondering a bit too. If it stayed with the no fans set up, I think it would have at least some impact in, in some event, right? Where pe- certain athletes are really great about feeding off the crowd. Certain athletes need that stage. Certain athletes might be spooked a little bit their first time around. And if there's 25,000 people staring at you, that's tough. That's a tough situation to manage versus it's you and a bunch of meat officials and yeah. a camera. And and the camera is beaming you out to you know, a million households, right? But when you're in the moment and you're competing, you may not be, yeah. you may not be thinking of that. So it's easier con- to convince yourself that this is just any other day. This is just any other race if there's not, you know, 10, 20,000 people in the stand. So I, I've, I thought about it from that perspective when I thought, okay, there's probably not going to be fans is different athletes are going to be able to manage um, this differently. But I want to start today's show talking about one guy who it doesn't matter if there's going to be one person in the stands, if there's going to be 100,000 people, if they're going to build extra stands to watch Ryan Krauser. Throw, it's not going to matter. It's not going to matter because Ryan Krauser – just continues to be on an absolute roll, Gordon. 23.01 meters at the USATF meet out in Tucson. Breaks the 23-meter barrier. It's the fourth best throw in history. He's the third man in history over 23 meters. PR'd by over 10 centimeters. Now he's only 11 centimeters from the world record. This was something last year. Krauser chucking it into the high 22s was something you were keeping track of it was a fun storyline and we thought hey maybe maybe 23 is possible it turns out he does it before the trials yeah and then this guy i mean he also i'm not gonna lie when joe kovacs threw his recent throw i think a Mm -hmm. week or two ago i was thinking like man krauser can throw 22 meters every day left and right but then Joe Kovacs can come in and maybe beat him. But now that Krauser has like done more than just I'm not just gonna be consistently 22. I can now throw all time level marks like a 23 meter mark. It definitely showed that he is the man, and that even someone like a Joe Kovacs, who is a world champion himself, is gonna have to have an out of body experience to beat someone like Krauser because 23 over 23 meters is is crazy. That's really <laughs> far, man. 75 it's a number feet? Like, yeah. It's so a number you didn't away. expect to see. <laughs> the video was awesome. The video was awesome. Not just because of what you saw, because of what you heard, right? Because they had a barrier out there. So he throws the shot. You hear it hit the ground. And then it hits the barrier almost instantly. It was like, boom, boom. Because he almost hit the barrier straight up. Right? They, you know, the whole, we're going to need a bigger boat thing. Or when someone jumps out of the pit in the long jump, we're going to need a bigger pit. Like, that's what, that's what it was like with, with, with Krauser here. Um, they're going to need to move that wall back a little bit. I don't know, uh, uh, you know, how, how easy that's going to be, but they're going to need to put it, I guess, beyond, beyond world record um, distance if they haven't already. I mean, look, <laughs> those of you guys watching, you see the throw right there. It just was like, boom, boom, right? It was instantly hitting that wall it's just he's so much fun to watch compete because you never know uh what he's what he's capable of and i mean do you think he can find another 11 centimeters oh yeah i think in the next year or two he's gonna find 11 centimeters he's gonna be whether it's at in at the trials at the olympics at usa's next year at eugene it's gonna happen like Mm -hmm. you can't be 
so consistently throwing 22 meters and not have one pop. 22 high. You just 22 high. 22 yeah. high. Yeah, you can't. Yeah. Like the the way, like I remember talking to Carl Lewis about uh, long jumping and mm-hmm. about was it take how do you know who is like going to perform on the day and he says it's not about who has the best pb it's about who can consistently jump for in in the college ranks can like have multiple jumps over eight meters like you want someone who can jump eight meters three times in a a round of six to show that like hey they have a baseline and therefore they're going to have that one 833 you know in jump five or jump six i think it's the same thing in shot put if someone is like your baseline is 22 mid, 22 high, then you are more set up to have that extreme throw down the line. And here's the first example of that when it throws 2301 uh, in Tucson. Tucson, man, they have a fun little thing where they do the two days apart, just like this whole like throws event. You yeah. The Tucson Elite Classic with the Throws Festival is pretty cool. So he was popping 22 highs, right, last year. But then with the first 22 high, I mean, he did one back in Doha too. You're like, okay, that was his outlier performance. And then what happened was he just backed them up, as you mentioned, like what Carl was talking about with the long jump, right? Then he just stacked 22 eights and 22 sevens to the point where it was just like, if he threw under 21 meters, it was a surprise, or under 22 meters in a competition, it was a surprise. And you were used to him going, you know, above 22 five quite frequently. I wonder now... You know, we could say this is his outlier performance, but I wonder now if we could see him hit 23 consistently. I wonder if that's going to be his no his new 22 high, right? It seems ridiculous, but that's what we were saying about the last mark that he hit. Yeah. I mean, you saw on the screen, 127 times he's thrown over 22 meters. It's, <laughs> it's insane, man. It's insane. Yeah. yeah. What have you done uh, 127 few, times in your life? I mean, we've podcasted 127 times, haven't we? At this point, yeah, we've done that. So, well, have we? Well, maybe not because Lincoln might have been a guest and might have been off. We're coming up on number 300, I think. Should we do something okay. special for our three? Should we do something special for our 300th podcast? Yeah, I think we should bring Lincoln back on. He should just do the whole thing thing by himself. So, yeah, we yeah, should do that. <laughs> That's the best. We should, but we should take the day off and then uh, have him go back. Speaking of Lincoln and Ryan Krauser, you cannot talk about Ryan Krauser and Lincoln without mentioning Lincoln's finest journalistic moment in the mix zone at either Doha or Des Moines. I don't remember. Ryan Krauser won, put on a cowboy hat because he likes different hats. And Lincoln asks him in the mix zone, is the cowboy hat an underrated hat in your opinion? And I just thought it was the best question anybody's ever <laughs> asked another person. <laughs> just what, really what did Ryan it. say? Yeah, he said he thought it was. Because, and I talked to Lincoln about this afterwards. I said, this, that was low-key a great question because most people would say, why do you wear the hat, right? Or when did the hat begin, right? But Lincoln went beyond that. He went to like the second level of like, hey, do you think it's an underrated hat? And it just led to a completely different answer. Uh, we have Statman John's tweet up there. He mentions uh, also Ulamar Rojas uh, almost breaking the the triple jump world record as well, too. That happened uh, this weekend. She was just a few centimeters off of it, seven, seven centimeters from the world record in the women's triple jump. So another one to keep an eye on. Yeah, I think we have video of uh, Rojas' uh, triple jump. So I think we put out a tweet. So Travis will pull that up here momentarily. But yeah, it's fun. And now it's not just the uh, distance events, uh, putting down some great marks in the year of 2021. We're starting to see some field events getting the action as Rojas, seven centimeters shy. That's yeah, that's pretty shy. 1543. <laughs> pretty shy in terms of you could, she can get it, or pretty shy ter- means she has a long way to go. No, pretty shy as she can get it. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was going to say, I think she's pretty close. Yeah, 1550 is the, the world record, which dates back to 1995. She now has the top two marks in history. So keep an eye on Rojas as well, too. If you're if you're on world record watch, I didn't think the men's shot put would be on world record watch, right? That's crazy, and that's pretty cool 
that Krauser got into the 23 meter mark there. Uh, yeah, Travis is now putting up the. Okay, so it was in Doha. I mean, he might have had the cowboy hat in both, but uh, that was the that was the, the fateful interview. Although I uploaded it, so maybe yeah. I, mean, I think Lincoln might have actually jumped into the back of my interview to ask that question. That's when I knew it was a serious journalistic endeavor when Lincoln was chomping at the bit to get that question about it being an underrated hat. Wonderful job by him. Uh, okay, Gordon. Yes. Two other meets. Uh, the Gateshead Diamond League meet, which was rainy and windy. Okay, here's and a question. And then you have the Boost Boston games. Is it Gateshead or Gateshed? Well, it's probably like Gateshed. You probably say it all together, probably. What is this? Or huh. If there's you know somebody in the chat who's good at pronunciation, let us know. Uh, and then you have the the Boost Boston games, which is a street meet. It looked like it was really windy, but none of the wind readings were crazy. But there were some. There were some. Oh, Gateshead. There you go, Gateshead. Gateshead. There were some uh, shots of competitors getting ready, and their wind was the wind was blowing their hair all around. So it's hard to really. I don't know, it's a, it's a street meet, right? You can't really read too much into the times. Um, but there were some surprises, some upsets, some interesting results to take note of. First, we'll start with the, the Boost Boston games there. Uh, Wade Van Niekirk ran the 200, the 200 straight. His first 200 since moving to the U.S., training with that group down in Florida, headed up by Lance Brom, and that includes Sean Emilio and Noah Lyles. He was looking really good for, what would you say, Gordon? 180 meters, 90 meters almost? He got basically to the end, maybe 175, yeah. if you're being really picky, and then and then pulled up and jogged across the line. Then he sat down afterwards, had a bit of a limp. I think he put out a tweet later that said he was fine. Obviously, you'd rather see him run. If you're a Van Niekerk fan, you want to see him <clears throat> run all the way through the line, uh, but he says it was nothing serious there. Uh, that race was won by Jerome Blake from Canada in 1989, by the way, which is fast time. I know it's hard to equate straight 200s to 200s with curves, but it is interesting, right? So Van Nieker gets the first time he gets hurt, charity rugby game in 2017. <laughs> and then this wasn't serious, but it would be like the cruelest irony if he gets hurt again running in a street meet straight 200. It's like his body can take the normal 200. His body can take the normal 400 or the 100. He does all these things, but then he gets into these weird, you know, different athletic situations and and that's what causes him, causes him issues. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> luckily it doesn't seem like it's that serious, but at the same time, where do you think uh, someone like Van Eekirk is – on the world stage are you i know lincoln super doubted him and got a lot of mm -hmm. shit on the internet for that but it's starting to kind of come true i mean do you look at him as a metal threat right now like if gun to your head are you putting money are you putting money on uh vinnie kirk meddling in tokyo in the in any event yeah two or the four I mean, no, I, no, I wouldn't because, I mean, he hasn't broken, you know, 20 seconds in the 200 this year. So I, I wouldn't put him on that list. I think there's a chance. I think there's obviously a chance he can get in and and get a medal. But if you're talking about 400, right, you'd have to put Curly ahead of him. You'd have to put Norman ahead of him. Gardner just had a, a tough break in a race. I don't know if he's okay after, after that fall. Zambrano meddled. I don't, we don't, do we know a lot about the men's four? Really? There's a lot of question marks in the men's four. So I don't think I would count him out of getting a medal. I think a gold obviously would be really, really hard, but betting my life right now, no. And I don't have any more houses to bet. So I cannot bet a house on him. I would count him out. I'm willing to make it official. He's not meddling in 20. 21. It's not happening. You're filling the Lincoln role here. He'd be so proud yeah. of you. It's not happening. Doing that. There's just too many other great young athletes. I mean, I it's very clear. Yeah, I mean, it, it's tough, right? You obviously break a world record, win 
consecutive gold medals and you think, okay, something's, he's got, he's going to go on this run. Right. And then all, all it took was really one injury to sort of disrupt that, that rhythm. And now we are here where we're here, but especially in the 400 where you're right, there's so much young talent coming up. So many people who can run uh, are capable of breaking 44. It's, it's almost, and when you saw Norman run 43, 45 last year, you almost thought, okay, the winning time is going to be now in, in 43 low. That just seems like it's inevitable. Now it didn't end up happening in 2019 because people got banged up and this, that, and the other. And you know, what, what you are in April isn't necessarily what you are in at the end of the championship season. But point is, it's just, it's hard to see another major championship where somebody isn't running 43 mid, right? And you have to be in really, really amazing shape to be 43 mid and Van Niekerk, it's it's been a while since he's been in that sort of form because of injury. He just had bad luck. That's just the reality of it. What other results do you think were no, uh, noteworthy in Boston? I mean, Isaiah Young. Well, bef- I think we before need, I, I think we need, yeah, well, go ahead. we talk a little bit about that. But I just need we need a little public service announcement. What was with the kids, the volunteer kids holding the blocks? <laughs> pull pull up a know. photo that I screenshotted. It's on the Twitter feed, Travis. Um, on full tracks, Twitter, you bring it up, but like this didn't make any sense. We'll put this up. All right. Look at this photo. They made all the kids turn around and not watch the race. Why can't they turn their bodies and look at the, the race? Like, what was the reason for this? Did they have like a giant Nike swoosh on their chest or something that they couldn't show to the people? Cause it was an Adidas meet. Like what's going on? Well, they're holding the blocks, right? So maybe they want the back of their foot to hold the blocks and not no, their toes? No, that, so that's not true because during the intros, they had them turn around as well. Like in the intros, they were not on the blocks, but they still were like they were in timeout and punishment having to just stare at a wall. It was crazy. They were like – I don't know. Do you don't, want a full investigation? Maybe they were afraid their faces would distract the viewer from the faces of the athletes that they want them to mm. focus on. But like – Who's like gonna be like, oh, look at the sixteen-year-old in the background? Now I'm not gonna read Noah Lyles' bio. Like, come on, no. They were trying to. <laughs> no, no. You put a lot of thought into this. I don't know. It makes I didn't no notice sense. It. I didn't notice it until you you mentioned. I mean, I would I would just default to it's a block uh, maximum block pressure technique, yeah, wasn't and it. maybe they. Ha- but maybe they had them stand like that just so they're ready because they don't want them to turn around. There isn't like there's a lot of space there either. But here's right? the thing. So like- Even when the gun was off and they weren't in the blocks anymore, if you watch the feed, they had to keep on facing that direction. Like they weren't even allowed to turn around after the gun went off. Mm. They had to like – the kids were like sneakily like kind of looking over their shoulder because they kind of wanted to look, but they didn't want to get in trouble. Something needs to happen, man. These kids <laughs> – Need to be able to watch the race. My God, I'm sorry. I I don't know. Maybe they just uh, they're in full focus. It's like the ball boys and ball girls in tennis. You know, just everything is very regimented. Yeah, right? but they're not staring at the wall like they're in detention. They are watching well, the competition. No, they're like locked in, man. Their eyes can't divert. They need to be ready to like throw that ball and then move and. Then yeah, they're pick locked up in, ball. but they're not locked in staring at pavement. They're <clears> locked <throat> in staring at the court. Where the action is happening. They're just absorbing that logo, man. They're just trying to get that embedded deep, deep, deep in their soul. I'm not sure I will offer any uh, theories. Um, I don't know. Okay. So now we can talk about the 100. Yeah, Isaiah Young. Got that off. Beats Noah Lyles. 994 to 1010. Lyles ran faster in the prelim with a 1003. Isaiah Young's been around long enough. I'm, I'm, putting him in my list of people who can make the team. I think he'd sneak out definitely a, a, a top three finish. I think he's that good. Are you worried about Lyles at this point? Or are you just going to like, hey, this is a street meet. No big deal. Uh, no, because if you bring up his the prelim result, Travis, can you find the prelim result? Um, what was it? Where... It was 10.03. I just said that. 10, yeah, yeah, but we should bring it on the screen. <laughs> Travis, so people can keep see going up right there. The, boom. the numbers ten oh three. There, look, there it is. Ten oh three. I know, I know. Just but you can see. So Isaiah Young went ten fifteen in that. Yeah, I mean, I feel like I don't know. I still believe in Lyles. I think he's slowly 
getting back to where he wants to be. I think he's just taking his time. Um, he hasn't been like a world beater early on, but maybe he's just deciding to kind of like chill this year and not try to break no Wait. world records or American records. I don't know. Is it chill just... in an Olympic year? No, he's not chilling in an Olympic year. There's no chilling going on. Listen, here's the thing. Uh, Lyle's in 100 meter finals this year. He hasn't won one. Yeah, he's he's zero for he's zero for three, right now. His 200 meters, he's won both of those, uh, one indoors and then one outdoors. I don't think it's a a huge issue, and maybe this is be something that pays dividends later on. I just thought it was it was noteworthy. Like his hundred season yeah. is not starting off. His hundred season is not starting off the same way it did in 2019 when he was like overperforming. He was like beating Christian Coleman. You're like, oh man, this guy is going out of his event and doing well. Now we expect more from him, <clears throat> um, but he's he's always, um, at least so far, he's he's finishing behind somebody that we expect him to to beat or at least contend with. Yeah, I mean, right now he's the tenth fastest time in the U.S. in 2021. Um, I mean, he has the same time as Micah Williams, the college kid at Oregon. Kenny yeah. Bees run the same time. I don't know. It's weird. Like, I kind of just, we're just like assuming he's going to make it because we're like, it's Noah Lyles. He's the next great sprint star. So, like, it doesn't make sense to count him out. But hey, we could see a situation where both Lyles and Gatlin don't make the team, right? And Bromel just runs away with it. And then it's just like, you know, like an Isaiah Young and uh, like a Chris Belcher or something like that make the team, or Isaiah Young and a college kid make the team. Mm hmm. Or a Ronnie Baker Here's, and a college kid. So we could have a weird we could have a weird top three and not have like the names of Lyles, Gatlin, and Bromel all make it. Give me your tiers for the men's hundred right now. All right. Well, tier one is Bromel, and he's the only one in that tier. There's no one close to that tier. And then I would say tier two normally would have been a Lyles and company, but I think I'm going to combine my tier two and my tier three. Like I normally would have a tier two and a tier three, but I think I'm going to have to combine tier two and tier three. And I would put a Baker, a Young, a Gillespie, a Kyrie King, a Belcher, a Lyles, and a Gatlin. Mm. Okay. All in that tier two. And then tier three would be the college kids, the Martin, Javon Martin, the Michael Williams, the Terrence Lairds, the Matt Bowlings. So interesting, because I think you have the guys who are all you... like the the Nike guys who just are on the circuit all the time. Well, Mike Rogers would be in that tier too as well. Sorry, but you know, I think if I asked you at the beginning of the year, you always had Bromel as the favorite. I don't know. I guess starting indoor season or maybe before, but I think even if I asked you then what were the tiers, I think you would have put Bromel and Lyles in the same tier i know i certainly would have yeah. but i think that i agree with you i think that's changed i think bromel is by himself i think lyles is closer to the third spot than he is to the first spot right now 100 if you're just looking yeah. at the numbers yeah maybe it'll change he's got to kind of the good thing about lyles is he's you know he's racing frequently enough so you're at least getting these baselines you're getting an idea of what he's capable of say the same thing about yeah. bromel too he's racing a lot as well too uh Aaliyah hobbs won the women's hundred which is interesting because I mean, we're still – obviously, we're assuming Richardson gets that top spot, and then the next two are up for grabs there. Gabby Thomas in second. Hurdles, Holloway and Harrison, no surprises there. And then Ajay Wilson finished runner-up to Natoya Gould in a 600, but it was on the road, which was weird to watch. It was, a, it was very fish out of water watching these 800-meter runners be without spikes and they're on this wide open road and they have all this space and they don't need to worry about navigating like curves or anything. It was very, it was very weird uh, to watch this. You know, you're used to like the road mile, but anytime time you go under the mile distance and you put people on the road, it's a, uh, it's a quirky event, but I'm not too worried about Wilson. She hadn't actually lost. I looked this up. She hadn't lost since 2019. She had a nice little win streak going, which makes sense because she's Ozzy Wilson, but this is her first loss in a while. I think it's funny that Aji Wilson and Ali Wilson, they finish 
right next to each other, back to back. Mm. And one twenty five low, one twenty six high. The funny, Aja Wilson, Ali Wilson. Good analysis, Good, uh, Gordon. That's like uh, I do want to say one thing. All right, this is going to come out of left field, and you're probably going to not. You're not going to take this take. You're going to be like Gordon. Who cares? It doesn't mean anything. But I can't wrap my head around these type of meats. Not that it's a street meat. I can't wrap my head around the idea of like an Adidas meat and a New Balance meat. So like New Balance Grand Prix and Adidas. This is more obvious where like it was just like an Adidas, a place. If you have an Adidas contract, you come here and you race. It's like Mm -hmm. the Adidas Invitational where everyone who's a current Adidas contract comes and races at an event um, and you you check off the box. And I think maybe Nike athletes have to do the same thing with Prefontaine maybe. But Prefontaine yeah. doesn't feel like a Nike only show for some reason because it it feels I guess it's because it's a Diamond League so it's going to bring in the best all over no matter what. It's not just gonna, but I felt like I was just watching Adidas athletes practice. Does that make sense? It makes sense. I mean, there were Nike athletes in this. There meet. were Clayton Murphy. Clayton Murphy won the yeah. road mile. We talked about Isaiah Young before. There were a lot of other Nike athletes. But, but yes, like, it's very clear when a meet is sponsored by a shoe company that the athletes are required to make an appearance. That's yeah. pretty clear. But I like think it doesn't feel like a real meet. Then you know, it feels like. There's no true competition because they're all just like <clears throat> showing up to the meeting so they don't get fun. I don't know. It like well, it's also when it's you, run on when, a street with a straight track. That might have been the other reason why you didn't think it was as like a typical meet. Yeah, that probably is a bigger reason. But you know what I mean? Also, I, just, I don't know. The tricky part with this, the whole idea with these street meets is people get closer to the action, correct? But they didn't have fans there. So it was a weird year to do it but so look it, at, it, it is interesting though because you would get i think you saw people compete that you wouldn't ordinarily see compete though because it's like hey you guys if you have an adidas contract you need to get out there and run and that made people more likely to go out and run we can't complain that people never race and then when they do race we're like nah it doesn't count doesn't count <laughs> we want to see you race differently you know what I'm saying? Oh, so I just we just got a message on YouTube. So if we go back to the um the tweet one tweet you have up now, Travis, put that up on the screen, Elon. So look, they're not in the blocks and they're still standing behind. They're still facing the other way like they're in trouble. Someone said, now this may not be true, <laughs> but some athletes complained about the kids looking at their butts. I don't know if that's true, but maybe that's why they made him turn around. That's a theory. The theory. I don't know. <laughs> but look, it just looks so weird that they're like having to stand like they're in trouble, right? It doesn't make any sense. I, I don't I know. I agree. It looks strange. I agree. It looks strange. You all have Sorry, to go back wrong. and watch pre previous uh, m- meetings. You need to go back and look at the record here and see how many times this has been the case. All right, let's let's go to. Gateshead? Gateshead. Am I saying that right, folks, in the chat? Let's see. Yeah, yes, Gateshead. Gateshead. Okay. Thank you to Matthew and Owen in the chat. Just made it real easy for me. There. Gates, space, head. Got it. I can do that. That's easy enough. Dean Asher Smith <clears throat> wins that awesome women's 100 that we had talked about. Now, the conditions were horrible. Rain, head wins. It was a minus 3.1. So, throughout the times, she runs 11.3. Shakira Richardson, 11.4. Tulu 11.48, and then Fraser Price, 11.51. So big news here. Asher Smith uh, gets the win. Were you surprised? Uh, yeah, but then when you think about it, you you feel like the dominance of Shikari, I think she probably was like, I'm, I'm just here so I don't get fined kind of mentality of like, right, I'm going to do the race, but like, I have no, like, emotional connection to losing this race or winning it. So, like, the only connection I have is completing it uh, with these, you know, 3.1 headwind in in the rain. And so I think 
it it does i mean dean asher smith is one of the best in the world so it's not like it was a a scrub that beat shakari but i still think shakari richardson's the fastest run in the world right now it's hard to imagine that we'll see these conditions in tokyo yeah and it's hard to imagine even in eugene even by eugene's standards where it can be uh supremely wet i don't think we'll see them uh i mean credit to asher smith for doing it in in horrible conditions i actually think the most notable result here is fraser price being and i think it's a good result for fraser price 1151 okay. at this point in the season only you know looking at the margin between her to first because i just think as the season get, goes on she's going to get better and if she's in range in the championships nobody does it better than than she does so i think i think it's a good result for fraser price it certainly i mean it tightens things up a little bit right the gap maybe not as big like you look at the times but you know, times aren't times aren't everything. You have to do it in a specific setting. And Asher Smith's one of those people where her PB isn't. She's better than her PB, I think. Right? Like she's what ten? Is he ten eighty five? I think Dean Asher Smith. So I, I think she's she's gonna if she had great conditions and, and the opportunity, I think she'd be somebody who could run faster than that too. It's just it's shaping up to be a great women's hundred meter season. Um, I was, yeah, 10, oh, sorry, 1083 for Asher Smith. Yeah, I was a bit surprised. Then I saw the weather, wasn't that surprised. That sort of, it throws a wrench into everybody's plans, right? We see this yeah. in distance racing too. It's the equivalent to, hey, you go out there on a cross country course and it's muddy and wet and it, it kind of th- screws with the, with the field a bit. And that was the case here. I also think for someone like Richardson, who is super new to the scene, it's good to take some L's. You know, you don't want to have a perfect, resume going into the olympics because you kind of you kind of need this like you know it's like in in basketball it's good to kind of it's good to lose you learn from losing you learn uh okay yeah clearly you can't just show up and run backwards and win no matter what right especially Mm -hmm. when you go up against people like asher smith who's a world-class athlete you could do that against a high school kid or college kid but the pro level it, it doesn't always work um Talent doesn't always win, and I think it's good. It kind of prepares you so she knows when she's locked in at the trials and locked in at, in Tokyo, she'll be ready to go. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And remember, it's her first trip overseas. Yeah. So she, she does Ostrava. <clears throat> she does this Diamond League meet. That's tough in and of itself just to navigate different time zones, travel, all those parts that go into being a pro that you probably – learn from with every single trip that you that you take so i think i think it's a show of strength by her to go over there and do it because i think if she was just thinking okay trials 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 she might just keep her head down say in the united states and get in a race here but i think she's thinking hey i'm gonna see these people in tokyo i want to know what it's like to line up next to them so i better get in this race now it shows that she's she's thinking beyond she's thinking bigger than just the trials uh men's i want to watch i want to talk about the men's 15 did you watch this men's 15 i'm gonna be honest i watched no track this weekend i know it's my job to watch track but i found myself in a daze of watching eight straight basketball games in a row unfortunately let let me tell you let me tell you what happened in this men's 15 okay Paint the picture. For the people who didn't watch well, it, paint it. So the the announcers mentioned something that we had talked about before, where this was like strength on strength on strength with Ingerbritz and Horror Mix Wayne, two, three guys who can race extremely aggressively from the front. Eric Swinski did a pretty good job r- rabbiting, but then Ingerbritson was left at the front. And I think because of the weather, Horror and Mix Wayne were content to just sit behind him. So credit to Ingerbritson. He led from a long way out, but Hor latched on. And just stayed behind him, but just didn't have that one little extra push in the home stretch to get past him. But still, 336.2 to 336.58, McSwain a stride back there. I mean, Oliver Hoare, I mean, he's made such tremendous strides in the last uh, year or so. It, it's kind of remarkable that he's sticking his nose in there and doing what he's done. Obviously, this is a great, uh, was it what we expect in terms of a debut from 
from Ingebrigtsen, but Horb did not make it easy on him at all. I thought the time could have been faster if Horb played the role of of the almost that second rabbit. But I, what he did was the smart strategy, which was let let Jacob be aggressive, use Jacob's uh, natural instincts to his advantage, and try to get past him. He just didn't have just didn't have enough. But Horb is a gamer, man. He sticks his nose in there, so credit to him. Yeah, I mean, I think I said in the in the pod before this race, like if he can like be in that conversation late in the race, that's like a good sign of where he can be when it comes to a Tokyo final. And he was point one behind Jacob with a hundred meters to go, so he was in yeah. the conversation. Um, and yeah, it's a great race all around for for. I mean, we haven't seen. I guess the most recent, the most, we haven't seen that many NCAA stars like be this good internationally this quick out of college, I would say. I mean, you probably count on like, on like one hand, you have Centro, you have probably Chris O'Hare was pretty good, but not, Chris O'Hare was never this good, I don't think. Josh Kerr, who is kind of, He's like in the same category as Oliver Horror right now, but maybe I would start thinking that Oliver Horror is surpassed what Kerr is right now. But it's not many, right? I mean, can you think of other, any other NCAA groomed fifteen hundred meter stars? Are you talking about just on the men's side? Yeah, on the men's side. No, and I think with Horror, it was interesting, right? He he upsets Kerr in eighteen, right? Yeah, but then but then didn't win another title, right? Loses indoors. Then 19, it's all about the, the goose and Kip, yard. the goose yeah. and Kipper Titch. Yeah. In that yeah. final stretch. Now, Horn never really had a bad race. He was always in the mix and he was very versatile. He would be way up there in cross country and really good in 15 hundreds, but I didn't see him think I didn't watch him in 2019 thinking this guy is going to be a metal contender at in 2021 i didn't see it at all because he wasn't winning ncaa races so why would you jump all the way to hey this guy can be a tenth of a second behind jakob ingerbritsen if he's getting beat by collegiate fields so i mean credit to him i think what's happening is his versatility and all the tools that he had in college is getting fun you know getting completely funneled in in the direction of the 1500 so he can just solely focus on that 1500 and you're seeing the benefit of just this really really strong skill set over a variety of events a variety of different seasons you know indoor outdoor and and cross country and that's what's bearing fruit i think i think he's right with kerr i think if kerr was racing in these meets i think we i think he's capable of the same things i mean remember kerr ran some crazy times um from from the front last year so i see them as similar in that respect but right now whore is running like a man possessed and it brings up an interesting thing mick Byrne tweeted this uh this weekend athletics australia <laughs> he asked what more what more does he need to do because they're not going to have the trials there in australia so basically whore has been on this audition process for the last month or so so and i think what mick Byrne is basically saying is this is his college coach basically saying, hey, can we stop this now so he can get like prepared? Because otherwise he's going to burn himself out trying to make the team that when he gets to Tokyo, he's not going to have as good of a chance as if he gets named to the team and can fully prepare. Is that a result? Is that the diamond? That... So Athletics Australia is pointing out the ninth place Gregson over Oliver Hoare, who got second in that race? Well, it says show the thread. Click on the click on the whole thread here, and then we can figure it out. Maybe they were mentioning every Aussie in the race. I mean, there was okay. a lot of Aussies in this race. Gre Gregson, Ramsden, Mick Swain, and Oliver Hoare. Yeah. Okay. I was wondering, it's like it's kind of weird to only point out the ninth place guy and not the, your best. You gotta look right at the whole thread. The yeah, gotta sorry. look at the whole thread. There he is. There he is. They were giving him some, some, some love there. But yeah, beating McSwain. 
right? Because before this, I would have had him second, but now when you're beating McSwain, you're beating the guy yeah. in Australia. He's on the t- he, I don't think you should decide your team this way, but I get it because of travel and different people in different countries and this year being weird. You're going to name your team. All of Horse should be on the team. Let's just say that point blank straight up. It's very clear what he's done over this last month, right? He is a metal threat. He is Australia's metal threat in this event. I think McSwain is a very good runner as well, too. I think McSwain could be in a, a metal threat in the 15 and 5, but there's no scenario where Oliver Horror is it should be excluded from the Aussie team. And if they are going to name a team, um, they should do it now, to Mick Burns' point. Well, yeah. I so mean, he I think he's, to, going to, so, he's going to be on the team. I don't think that's – I think it's more – Aussie telling him now versus waiting is the right because there's there's right. nothing more there's nothing three other Aussies can do that's going to be better than what Oliver Hor is doing right now. Yeah, what's his se- like? Look at Oliver Hor's season from you know this time three thirty six isn't him isn't one of his best times, but he's a tenth behind two tenths behind Jakob Ingebrigtsen. I mean, like that's <laughs> that's an incredible result. And anybody watch that race, you're looking at it and you're thinking, okay, this is a guy who belongs it wasn't like he was just Jakob was playing around out there he was he was running hard and he beats McSwain too so I mean his season we could put put it up here yeah 333 333 two wins one at Hayward one at Mount Sac and then a 336 great runner up and then you go to indoor season a 332 yeah there's not many people in the world who can do that and I, I mentioned before we're gonna talk tears again there's the chariot and Ingebrigtsen and then there's a whole bunch of people who are vying for that third through 12th ranking in the world right now. And Hor is one of them. That's right, man. That's right. Anything else happened interesting at this meet? Well, you love the steeple in the United States. So I wanted to give you time to talk I do? about Hillary board. Hillary I love Board's the steeple. 8, 830, horrible conditions. No wind reading for steeple events, Gordon. But if there was, it would probably be pretty, pretty, pretty deep. I is this the steeple at the uh, U.S. trial is going to be a stealth good event here? Because we got questions about Jagger. You've already put McGordy on the team. You actually helped him book his travel to Tokyo, which I thought was nice of you to do. But I don't know. You can't discount Hillary Bohr winning a Diamond League, can you? Well, Hillary Bohr is going to make the team. You can pick three. It's going to be McGordy, Bohr, and, uh, and Jagger. Okay. It's my three. It's done. That's it. Move on it's to done. the next right. event. It's like the Aussies, they gotta pick Ollie and move on. We we already picked our team. It's McGordy, Jagger, and Bohr. Let's move on to the next event. Simple. We should do a uh, pod before the trials that's titled "Events That Don't Need to Be Run at the Olympic Trials." Where you just... oh, yeah, that would be great. <laughs> and then, like do like so many, and like people will be very upset. It's like, but, are you kidding me? Bye buys there are people actually we should do this episode we should wait maybe one more week maybe one more week we'll wait we'll get into june and then we'll be like who are we wondering about still because i have a list in my head of people i'm wondering about who we haven't seen or we have seen and the results have not been spectacular like who needs to still show us something who's somebody who we assumed that would would be in you know basically the Centro list before Centro ran 335 yeah. and looked fine. Pe- people like that. But there's other people who aren't as high profile who belong in that list. I guess I forget every year how close people cut it with the trials, meaning how much some of the good people, how long they wait to debut in yeah. events is strange. But I guess when I looked up some people from years past, I guess it's not that common but so we have and these people aren't on my list because they're beyond it but let me just mention some people shelby houlihan right we haven't seen her nope uh and then in the four meter hurdles we haven't seen the best two women in world history run a four meter hurdle race this year yeah have they I forgotten how to hurdle on. maybe <laughs> maybe uh well, we sydney's well, only we used to the 100 hurdles is not going to have her steps right because she'll be right. expecting the hurdle to become sooner than later she's going to clear it by like a huge margin you know what else yeah. is surprising me too there's a lot of u.s athletes going to the doha diamond league event 
which I did not anticipate going into the season. That's something I was big wrong on here. Money talks. That's how it works. Sure. But how much money is there? More than zero, right? A free flight and get like a thousand bucks. Sure. Why not? I don't know. A thousand bucks. I don't know. I just thought I, it was more of worrying about traveling to foreign countries and getting back and getting in and different countries thing. And then you're dealing with, with Doha, you're dealing with huge, huge time zone things. I thought people might do Gateshead, but then I thought basically people would keep a pretty low profile on the, in the diamond leagues until after the trials. That was my assumption, which is, is wrong. And I guess I'm glad, I'm glad I'm wrong because it means more people running more high level meets, right? So you're going to have Fred Curley, Karani James, Michael Norman in the Doha 400, which is nuts. Uh, Emma Coburn is going to debut in the, in, in the steeple at this meet as well too. They already have the entries out. Wow. Shout out to Doha for already having their entries out four days was before. It, wasn't Emma you know Coburn boycotting? Is? Wasn't Emma Coburn boycotting the Diamond League? Wasn't that? Yeah, but they, put the steeple, Sh- they put the steeple back in. Okay. Have you not been paying attention to anything that's happening in track and field? They, they took all those events out and then they put them all right back in. That, that's, that's what happened. The Diamond League cut events and then did a complete, did a complete U-turn there. Man, look at, look at those entry times. Look at those entry okay, here times. We go. Look at that. There you go. There's Emma Coburn making her 2021 steeple debut. All right, Travis, keep on going. Go to another entry. Let's, uh, Hold on. World record here. holder in there. Let me look at this world record holder in there and guess a Kraus and there's okay next one you can go to the next one now next one all That's right fine. let's do a let's do a shuffle up and do, we each get to pick one event so we don't need to go through all of them I want to see the men's fifteen Travis I want to see who's in that <laughs> and the winner is oh mm, you just drew the chariot Timothy chariot card well done okay but that's no one else really can competing ah. uh to farah mcswain that's not a bad pick can you do the okay go back to the uh can we try the this is a fun game <laughs> i'll ha- i'll take i'll take women's 100 for 100 alex and see do, are we gonna get fraser price again second to last event there will we get fraser price again in this women's 100 we will yes oh she can as well okay there you go there we go I She's... think I'm winning our event picks right, all right here. No, all right. I get one more pick. You can keep your picks. men's 1,500. No, I'm, I'm, I'm going to trade it in. Okay. I'm going to men's eight. Trade it in. Maybe we'll see a brazier. Let's see if we see a brazier. Give me a brazier. <sighs> no brazier. Oh, man. This was a big swing and a big miss. <laughs> Nigel big Amos. Miss. You get Nigel Amos yeah. there. Uh, men's 200? I don't. I didn't hear anything about Lyles, but this is basically maybe a, a Lyles? pure... Or maybe we'll get. I think we'll get a Kenny B for sure. Will we get a Lyles though? We get a Kenny. Oh, we get B. a Gatlin. We'll, okay. Degrass, is Gatlin gonna bad. be able to make it the full two hundred meters, or will Gatlin's not, age, his body break down before he gets to the two hundred meter mark? Because he's 1950, too old. 1957, I remember that. I remember that. Too. I remember that, that too. Dry. He ran that not in a straight line too. He kind of like weaved. Oh man, under. yeah, yeah. Well, that was the year. Was that the year that? Merritt was running the 200 too. So you had two guys in there who didn't didn't have a ton of experience running the 200. Go back one more time. Let me look at the... Oh, is there a women's 400, 400. hurdles? There's a men's 400 no, hurdles. The men. Yeah, let's... Do we, are we getting Benjamin? Ooh, yeah, by Benjamin. And Samba. Is... Okay, here it is. Let's go. All let's right. Go. All right, one more from me. Back to Doha. I'm going back to Doha. <laughs> Thank you. Here we go, Josh. One more from me. Uh, let's end. give me, you know, let's do women's 800. No, women's 3k, women's 3k, women's 3k, women's 3k. I should... oh. Hannah Green, that's great. Go, I want women's 3k. Maybe we get Bar. <laughs> Maybe we'll get some Bowerman. We'll see. No, I think they're running there. Last States. event. Okay. You're right. Bo, 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 bo. Speaking Not of the beer. women's 800, speaking of the women's 800, mm. did you see who got third? In the 5K at the Anduar meet, running 
Speaking of the women's 800, did I see who got third in the women's 5K at the Andujar Diamond League meet or the Continental yes. Tour meet? Um, no, JoJo. No. Okay, I don't know. Speaking of the 800, did you see who got third? Oh, oh! <laughs> I got so excited, I started coughing. Nian Saba. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Go. Here, show a screenshot. There, boom. Yeah, Nian Saba runs fifth. Okay, she didn't run 15, 13, she ran 15, 12. Incredible mark. And it's a big F you to World Athletics saying, like, you cannot ban human beings from competing based on how they were born. And it's, I'm so happy that she's running this well. And I want her to make the Olympics. I want her and I want Caster Semenya to also come in and make the Olympic team in a, in a 5K and just. You know, I would love if they won. I don't think they're going to win because 5K is pretty good and there's some great talented women in, in that event as well. But yeah, the whole idea that you're cheating if you're running a 400 to 1500, but you're not cheating if you're running a 3K or higher makes no sense at all. It's clearly a targeted thing at one or it's targeted at a few athletes. Caster Semenya being the the main character in this whole situation. But Caster, what does she run so far? So she's run uh, a 904-3K. And she's run... So her 5Ks haven't been to... But those are championship races. 15, but 904... 15, yeah, 15-50 in a 5K. 904-3K, that's, that's solid. It's definitely not 15-13 pace yet. But, man, I I want both Semenya and Nisimbaya... How do you say her last name? Did I say it right? Nian Frank? Saba. Nian Saba. I want them to both make the Olympic team in the 5K. And uh, just be like, yeah, your rules make no sense. How all of a sudden are you now going to say it's illegal for me to be running 12 laps instead of four? It makes no sense. So I'm really excited about this. 15, 13 so is a legit where, time. So I mean, with so. your knowledge of the world rankings, will – Will that be fast enough to get in, or do you think she's going to need a standard? Nian Saba? Yeah. So go to go to World Athletics Rankings here. We're going we're to walk our way through this. Go to Event Rankings. To the left. Got it. Boom. Nope, nope, back. Not Stat Zone. Just Event Rankings right there. <laughs> All right. Uh, we're, we're talking to we'll – show this on the screen so we can watch us go through this process. So wins 5K. Is- and now click – instead, limit by country. Go back up. Change limit by country to three per country. This is a mind inside. And then I think how many make it? I think 40. 40. Is it 40? Five? Say 45. Mm, I, I could look at that. I think it's is 45. So click on that. Click. No, just click on 45. Click on it. So it'll pop up. Okay. So this athlete has run. You got If you hover over and scroll to the right, you can see the marks. Yeah. Look at those marks. 15, 1550, 1549, 1544. That's possible. Oh. If you run 1513 once or 12 once, mm-hmm. you see you run a couple more times and you will have a high enough ranking. Yeah. Okay. So we shouldn't get fixated on the time. She's just got to get in these no. races and be. Yeah, she's got to just run twice, <clears throat> two more times. Well, and I'm assuming the Anduhar meet, because it's Continental Tour, it's worth points, more points than just a regular random five, yeah. correct? <clears throat> exactly and 3k's count too so uh caster's 902 is going to count towards this and that should help her get in as well so um yeah it looks oh, yeah, like you need to be like a caster yeah you need to start tweeting Nian saba about her ranking see if she knows <laughs> that she can she can get it but 50 that's no joke she's going to be competitive in there yeah i mean that's obviously ridiculously difficult to go from running the 800 to moving all the way up to the 5,000, but she's, she's finding a way somehow to, to get it done. Remember Semenya last year was dabbling in the 200 too. So we were wondering, is she going to go to the shorter distance or the longer distance? And looks like the longer distance won out there. So another story to keep an eye on. Yeah. I, I I saw that result this weekend, but it escaped my mind when you brought it up. So keep an eye on Nian Saba there. So on the pod, on Wednesday, when we'll be back, I will successfully predict 
who will qualify for NCAAs in the distance events. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to focus every, on that. Uh, maybe event. I'll do sprints too. Maybe I'll do every event. Every. It might be a little hard. Maybe I'll do every event. We'll see what we do in the, in the pod. But that's hard to do sometimes because you got to predict like in a 1500 who would make it to the <clears throat> second round in the prelims and then, you know, time. It's not just the top 12 that make it, right? You got to find out how it works out. and We'll do mm-hmm. a big uh, who's going to nationals prediction show on Wednesday. Just yeah. Fun. And then Wednesday we'll start talking about the results of that. And then Monday we'll be able to recap it. We'll also do a deeper dive into the Doha Diamond League meet this week and all the other big meets that are on tap. Any last words, Jordan? Go Sixers. That's all I got to say. <laughs> all right. That's enough Sixers talk. Thanks to Alon <laughs> for producing. Thanks to Travis for producing as well. Podcast at gmail.com is the email address. Subscribe to our YouTube page, Flowtrack Podcast. Remember, you can watch us live Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, 9 a.m. Central Time on YouTube. We'll talk to you guys on Wednesday.